I work with some really good colleagues like Mike Garofalo and Tom Pelissero, who also like bourbon and like to drink like we do. Um, but they have sort of allowed me to step away for a little bit. Uh, I always have my phone. So people are always like, oh, like, when do you put your phone away? I don't put my phone away. Like I played golf today. I have my phone in my pocket the whole time because at least if something happens, like I know about it and can react. The Fred Minnick Show is brought to you by 291 Colorado Whiskey, by Michter's, and by Heaven Hill Brands. And I'm wearing my football cufflinks for my special guest today. Joining the Fred Minnick Show, the great Ian Rappaport, who's been breaking news since, really, since I've been a fan of football. I mean, you are you are the guy when it comes to everything NFL news, and it's a pleasure to have you on I did not know you were such a bourbon fan, but that's good to know. Uh, it's good to be, as a matter of fact. Um, yeah, man, it, it's it's actually interesting because like it it has been uh, it has been kind of a long road to get here. You know, like in college, I didn't drink bourbon. After college, I didn't drink bourbon. I drank beer, like everyone else, a little bit of vodka, whatever. And then at some point, I was like, you know, I'd go to bars. Or I would sit at night on the couch and be like, I would like a drink. I don't have anything to drink. And so at some point, uh, I did a little research, did a little reading. Um, and I'm like, I will teach myself to like something. And I chose bourbon. Um, and I basically, I think like a lot of people, started drinking like, you know, this much a night. Like mm -hmm. small sips. And really liked it. Um I've been in ever since. It's probably been, I don't know, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years. Um, but yeah, I would say like pretty regular thing. Like it a lot. Uh, appreciate it a lot as well. You know? yeah, and you come to Kentucky, so you get to feel it a little bit too. Yeah, that's that's one of the cool things. We were at the Kentucky Derby this year where you and I met for the first time. Mm -hmm. um, that was our second time to the Derby. Um, it was you know, not the first time I've been to Kentucky, but um, last time we were there for the Derby, um, the guy we were with was like, hey, we got a couple of events, um, you know, beforehand, do you mind coming with us? I'm like, sure. Uh, and we went to, I believe, where did we go? Um, well, we, first of all, my wife and I sampled all the different little distilleries around town, which is, which is very cool. I think it was Angel's Envy first, I forget. Um, but anyway, we went on a little bit of a tour and, uh, and it is, you know, it's like, they always say like drinking in person is always a little better. Like this experience yeah. was very cool. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely, you know, the, if you, if you taste a whiskey inside a distillery, you know, you can be wowed by everything around you, the smells, the people, and then you bring that same whiskey home you're like. I don't like that as much. You know, it's not always the case, but it happens sometimes to people. Yeah, and 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 that's okay. You know, and and one yeah. of the things like it's also like it's funny you mentioned that like so I have a neighbor who's very much into bourbon and he will buy bottles, he will do the secondary market. He's very Garif Mike Garofolo like, you know, he digs yeah. deep into the secondary market. And he has like taught me a little bit that it is okay to be like, you know what? this thing that I paid some money for actually don't like that. Yeah. You know, like he ended up coming over uh, to our house a couple weeks or no, a couple months ago at this point and was like, Hey, do you want a couple bottles of the mic drop? And I'm like, yeah. Like why? And he's like, just not for me. Wow. And I was like, okay. Like, and, and so now we have like, three bottles just cause he's like, you know what? Bought it, paid some money. Not for me. Definitely. Okay. Uh, okay to think like that in the bourbon world, you know? Yeah, that is true. And, and you know, there's a bit of a bottle chasing, kind of a bottle hunting. And I've, you know, I covered, I've covered the bourbon industry in a, you know, similar way, different, but similar to the way that you've covered the NFL over the years. And, you know, just there's so much marketing and so many things behind um, all all the hype and all the bottles out there. And, and we've gotten ourselves into a situation where 
bourbon is is more about the hunt for a lot of people and getting the bottle, like scoring it, than it is actually drinking it. So at least your neighbor is cracking open those bottles of mic drop to find out he doesn't like him. So I'll give him that. So kudos there. So yeah, how to- Yeah, and I don't- Oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say, I don't get too much into the bottle chasing because I, I am like, you know, I would say I'm like really early into my mm-hmm. my bourbon world and I don't know enough. So I don't know what to chase. Um, I know what I like, but I don't know what to chase. So I'll leave that to the sort of experts and I will, I will drink the stuff off the shelf until I get really, until I, until my palate sort of, you know, gets textured enough, I would say. Uh, and it seems like the NFL too. Bourbon is the is what people like to drink in their off time. I've had a lot of bourbons with uh, NFL players and reporters, and it seems that that seems to be the uh, the drink of choice in the NFL world. It does kind of seem like that. And you know, it's, it's funny. Like I mentioned, Garofolo. Like I was a little surprised when I found out how into it he is, and he's not alone. Like it actually comes up in conversation frequently, and you know, like the journalism world, like there's a lot of conversations at hotel bars and sort of like convention type bars. And you're always, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm like very like Snoopy, you know, mm-hmm. like someone orders a drink. I'm always like, what you got? Like, I always want to know. And yeah. so when someone will be like, you know, I don't know, like bullet Ryan ends up being what I order a lot. Um, and someone will order that. And I'm like, Hey, like, okay, you know, or, yeah. you know, I'll order some like Basil Hayden or something and I'll like judge a little bit or like, there's always a little like, you know, I always want to know. Uh, and you get a lot of bourbon drinkers and a lot of people who know like a little bit, kind of like me, like a little bit of what they're talking about. Enough to be dangerous, right? That's so uh, you would be, uh, I'll give you a, a few few players I've tasted with and okay. I'll, let you, I'll let you guess who I thought had the best palate. All right. Uh, Charles Woodson and Dominican Sue, Peyton Manning, and uh, Kyle Randolph. Who do you think had the best palate out of that crew? I would say Woodson probably. I mean, he. I actually like. I have a a, a bottle of the. Um, I think it's a white wine barrel that he makes. Um, that I've been drinking recently, actually, and I kind of like it. Um, yeah. My guess would be Woodson or Sue would be my guess. So Sue's pretty good. Uh, Kyle, Kyle is a, is a lot. He's he's an enthusiast. You know, he's all about learning, and you know, he doesn't really doesn't force his like thoughts out there a little bit. But he's a big, big fan of just learning. Peyton is, um, you know, Peyton owns a brand as well, and he's kind of uh, yes, he's, he's 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 in that learning fa- phase as well. Um, but Charles Woodson, that man has a palate. Like he has like a he has a pro level, very good palate. Um, I really enjoyed tasting with him. And yeah, that didn't surprise me at all because you know Woodson was pretty talented. Obviously, very athletic, very talented. But in his last years in the NFL, it was like he was smarter than you. He knew more. He studied more. Like it's mm. kind of what he's about. Like he was a dynamic player in part because he knew what was going to happen. So like I could see him being like, yeah. I'd like to get into bourbon and then just knowing everything about it and like learning. And like, I could definitely see that. That's interesting. Yeah. He's, he's a, uh, he's a smart cat. He definitely is. All right. So let's go ahead and, uh, and, and jump into it. Now we are, you are tasting blind. All right. So you're going to be just be tasting, um, yes. a, B and C. <laughs> and, uh, we're going to go ahead and start with, um, glass a, and we, for those who don't know, this is yeah, what it looks like. The little, uh, the little tasters there. And Very nice, stylish. We're going to start with A. Okay. We're going to start with A. And and uh, ordinarily, when I have a guest on, you know, I, I have a lot of like people who are not very acquainted with bourbon, and so I go through like a tasting tutorial. I'm not going to do that with you because you you've been around the block a little bit and you kind of got your own style. But well, that's okay. I, I wouldn't mind a little bit of schooling. I, I would say you are the okay. expert. Okay. All right. Not, so I would not, I, like, one of the best things about my job, there's a lot of great things. One of the best things about my job is it's totally cool to be like, 
hey, I don't know what you're talking about. Explain this to me because experts will really tell you and then you get right. good stories. Out of it. So, you know, that's sort of where I'm at. So anyway, you can, you can give me the uh, the short version, I would say. So we're we're tasting bourbon today. Everything that's on in your glasses will be uh, will be bourbon. Um, so with bourbon, you know it has to go into a new charred oak barrel every single time, and so that's why I like to me like the color is like so important, and I like to swirl it around, kind of analyze the color, and just the the looking at the color. It, it's it's really like looking at looking at an album cover. It can get you excited about the music uh, by looking at the cover. The color uh, is is everything uh, in terms of like what is to come. The darker it is means the higher the proof and the older it is. Um, you know, sometimes a really dark bourbon will taste woody, and and you you know that going in like that that color because it extracts all that color from the wood. And he swirled around. You push the aromas up, and you bring it to your nose. And when you smell bourbon, you want to smell with your mouth open slightly. It's relaxing your olfactory, and then you want to go side by side, you know, really lasering in and isolating your nostrils because, you know, they don't work. Uh, they work differently. You know, they're cycling air. And, you know, you can pick up different notes on each nostril. But you can get a and kind of hover around the glass as well, and you can really, you can really pull out flavors that you smell just by hovering it around. You know, you'll smell something here that you wouldn't have over here. So, the aroma part, you know, you see people doing it in a bar, and it's kind of just kind of going back and forth like that. It looks like they're really getting into the glass. And it's because you are you you you're connecting with it, you're smelling what the what's to come, what might be on the palate. So, what's the smell like to you, right off the bat? Oh man, see, I'm not good at this. This okay. is one of my great, one of my great weaknesses. My well, wife let's... is a uh, my wife is a uh, worked in worked at Starbucks for ten years, and she's very good at picking out the notes of coffee, and I'm always very jealous of it. So Mike, not- Mike said she's a good taster. He said she's the big bourbon taster in the in the in the house. She has joined us, by the way. He just handed over the glass. Caramelly to me. She says caramelly. It's a big caramel bomb, actually. It's a big old caramel bomb. So, so Ian, just do just let's just make it simple for you. Is it good to see you? Hi. I was going to say syrup, but is, again, like I didn't know if that was going to be like dumb or not. Is it sweet? So syrup. So it's in the sweet category for you. Okay. So the next part is putting on the palate. And all my training is over the years, it's been with like master sommeliers and master distillers. But this is a part that I actually, I picked up. Um, so I'm a veteran. Those are my, my, my boots that I wore in Iraq right behind me. And the, when I got back home, um, I was in therapy, and one of the techniques that I learned to ground myself was called taste mindfulness, and it helped me kind of learn how to live and enjoy and appreciate life again. And it was I would put something on my tongue, I would close my eyes, and I would think about it, how it felt on my tongue. And something happened in that moment, like, like things started triggering in my brain and connecting my brain to my palate. And for the first time, I was really thinking about what I was eating and what I was tasting. And I noticed that while I was thinking about stuff, I could pick up more. And so since then, the, when I do a taste, the first thing I do is I just focus on what part of the tongue is it resonating. And then I'll taste again to try to really focus on that part of the tongue. So you'll find that the sweet notes are on the tip of the tongue, the Savory notes are in the middle. The bitterness is in the middle toward the back, and the spice is toward the back, and you'll also get bitterness toward the side. So the first thing I want you to do, Ian, is just put a little bit on your tongue and really try to think about what part of the tongue is it resonating. Tip. Tip and then a little... Tip and then a little here. I would okay. 
So, so is yeah. it is it the strongest on the tip then? Definitely the strongest on the tip. Yes. Great. So now go back in and and Lee, where did you where did you f- find it most promising? On your I got tip? it full middle, like almost nothing on the tip. Nothing on the tip. So it, you know it's interesting. Every taster is different, right? Every, it's just like athletically. You know, you of all people, you know this. Like, you can put two people who look exactly the same, run the same speeds, you know, have the same grains of the combine, everything, but they get on the field, they're completely different. And there's the same thing with tasters. Like, you can taste the exact same thing and be completely different. You know, the the palate is as much as an athletic right. tool um, as as your body. So. Go back in and really focus on the tip of the tongue of of where you felt it and think about all the sweet things that you enjoy and see if anything pops up in your memory if it's triggered when you taste. Um, yeah, definitely feel it on the tip. I would say... Uh, I, it tastes like syrup. It tastes like figs. Okay. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, definitely like yeah. caramel because it's a little flat kind of. I don't know how to describe it, but a little bit flat. Um, not spicy, not hot, like just kind of nice and sweet. See, that that's that, those are good tasting notes. Those are definitely good tasting notes. And I'll tell you that when you find out what this one is, you know, your neighbor might be a, be a calling. Uh, this is a this is a really good, um, really good one. Lee, what did you think here? I'm still getting pure like caramel toffee, like super sweet desserts, like flan, caramel brulee, that sort of thing. So all, all the sweet notes that would have like a like more of a savory component, like a flour or like a hardness to it. That's it, kind of what you're describing there. Like a little bit, you know, sweet, but not over sweet, like a syrup. No, not, be. not syrupy at all, but just no. like the most perfect sweet dessert. Okay. I like that. And then the last part of a tasting is the finish. And that's how long it's still on the palate uh, after you've swallowed and you still have, you'll have taste buds in your throat and in your belly as well. So if you can feel a little bit in your throat, uh, that's actually your, your taste receptors in there. And so you feel it on the way down. It's a little bit of a little bit of a hug, a little bourbon hug there. So um, so glass A, thumbs up. Thumbs, thumbs up. up. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's let's go to uh can, can I also mention that Leah Leah has made herself a drink. I don't know what's in here, but oh. she came down and prepared. Oh she okay. <laughs> She's got her. You got your own thing going on here, huh? Yep. That is. Uh, I don't blame you. Very, we got a smoker. What do you call that? Like a smoking gun, basically. Oh, for uh, for cocktails. Smoking. Yeah. I don't know if you can see it smoking. Yeah, those are cool. Got a little smoke left here. Whoa. Yeah, that'll if you if you have a smoke cocktail and go into a tasting, that'll jack your palate up. <laughs> That's why I'm not drinking yet. <laughs> so let's go to uh, to glass B, and and as you're doing that, you're um, I'm I'm a I'm accustomed to thinking about you having like three phones in your hands, finding mm-hmm. what free agent deals happening, who's getting fired, who's moving on, and what have you. You're actually taking a break right now. Now this will air later. But you're taking a break right now. Do you do you get the shakes when you're away from uh, all the action, or? Um, it it is different a little bit. So one thing I've done, I would say, over the last probably four or five years, is maybe three or four years. That's a lot lighter. Um, the last three or four years is well, I have I work with some really good colleagues like Mike Arafol and Tom Pelissero, who also like bourbon and like to drink like we do. Um, but they have sort of allowed me to step away for a little bit. Uh, I always have my phone. So people are always like, Oh, like, when do you put your phone away? I don't put my phone away. Like I played golf today. I have my phone in my pocket the whole time because at least if something happens, like I know about it and can react. 
Like I'm, it's not like right. I'm like actively making calls, but if I get a text, if I get a call, like I can be on it. And kind of the way I can function through this little downtime is um, I will like stay – at least I will stay involved and know what's going on, even as I take some downtime. Mm-hmm. Then I can still like take a call, tweet some news, calm myself, hit a golf shot. Like it just has developed kind of over the years, I would say. And you're you're usually you're usually the first on breaking on breaking stories, uh, you know, and that's always been very impressive to me because it's such a competitive world. Oh. To get um, to get the you know free agency acquisition or whatever out there on Twitter uh, before your competitors and it is like is like how do you how do you develop the relationships over the years to you know to get that first um, to have the first to be the first to break something do you do you bribe them with bourbon you know is, does that ever come into play. I mean- now, I will say there's some relationships that have been fostered over a drink or two that can happen from time to time. Um, but it really is so interesting. Like, obviously, what I do is is journalism and reporting, but so much of it is based in the relationships where, you know, people have to trust you with really important, a lot of times private information and be OK with you knowing it beforehand until it's ready to come out. And that takes trust and that takes mm-hmm. time. So rarely do I meet someone and then like two weeks later, they're saying, Hey, here's this big story. I have it doesn't really work like that. It's a lot of conversations, a lot of trust, a lot of texts, a lot of calls, a lot of back and forth to get to the point where they're like, you are going to be the one who will break this story. Or, you know, what'll happen is I'll find out something, I'll contact someone and they'll be like, yes, like you are right about that. But like, we'll work together and I'll give it to you when it's time, but like respect the process of a trade or a contract right. or whatever, and kind of like not ruin it for lack of a better term. Mm-hmm. Um, that takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of legwork. Yeah, that, absolutely. And, and you're, you're already doing the, uh, doing the analyzing of glass B. I heard you say it's quite a bit lighter. Yes. So, Kudos to you for for seeing that right away. But just because something is different in color, don't dismiss it right away. What's your nose? What's your nose picking up on um, on glass B? Uh, it smells very hot. Okay. Um, Light you're you're, you're smelling some alcohol on it then. Alcohol, yes. Yeah. Um. Yeah. And I, don't, I don't know. Like it's tough to pick out. I do. What about you? Same. It just smells hot. It's got some heat there. Now right, let's put it on Which the. Which I generally, I generally like, and especially we will use for mixed drinks. The hot, sort of like the hotter, the better for mixed drinks. Right. You know? Right. I just. Oh. I just spilled. Uh, I just spilled it all over my computer, so that's not good. Oh, no. So if it, uh, if it doesn't it, drink hot at all. See, it's weird. Like I'm trying to. I don't really do this quite like this, and I'm trying to understand what I'm smelling. And it's like I'll smell some fruits, like strawberries, and some like earthiness. And I'm kind of like, is that what I should be smelling? Well. What you smell is what you smell. You know, we can't tell you what to smell. That's the. Right. Yeah. But this, that's actually interesting because it smells really hot, but mm-hmm. it drinks really soft. It it does. It comes off like uh, it. You, and you you all were both right with the with the alcohol call out, but you know after that there were there were some subtleties in there. I was picking up like some cornbread uh, on the nose and then on the palate. You know, it's there is that. There's like cornbread. You know, real basic, um, and then maybe like some uh, banana pudding. You know, it's not, but you can tell that these are two very, very different bourbons. I mean, I'm from Mississippi, so all these foods are speaking to me. <laughs> what part of Mississippi did you grow up? Uh, like northeastern. I went to school in Mississippi State, so okay, right around. Oh, 
Yeah. yeah. See, this is so interesting. Sorry to interrupt. This yeah. is so interesting because the first one really got me tip of the tongue and then here and stayed with me for really the whole time we were talking. This smelled a lot hotter. But as I'm talking to you now, it has gone. Like the staying power is a lot less. Yeah. yeah. It smelled hot but didn't taste hot and really felt like um, – God, I don't know how to like describe it. It kind of like it was here and then it wasn't like it, the it, like wasabi. The, like yeah, but like, I'm trying to like and then gone. see. This is like tough for me because I'm trying to describe like the taste and like yeah, it's just hard for me to describe. And but comparatively, you you like A over B for yeah. right now. Yeah, for sure. I would okay. say I do. Although. Okay. I would, I would say I definitely do. Well, to me, I, it I, tastes like A was significantly more aged than B. That is a, I will say that is a correct assessment. That is a correct assessment. The glass C is going to be a, a far closer and better comparative. So we'll go ahead and go to glass C. What are the and things? This has, that... always been, this has always been my frustration with bourbon is like, I know what I will. I've added my own glass. I, oh, okay. I, this was like one of Leah's best presents for me. That's a nice glass. Yeah. Riedel glass, but Riedel. just Riedel. My glass. favorite. Um, but this has always been my frustration is I know what I like, I know what I don't like, I know what it feels like, but I don't do a great job of explaining what it tastes like. You know, it's like I can do like if there's like three parts of it, I can do like two of the three, you know? Yeah. I, and I think, you know, let it begin. Let the process begin kind of like I showed you focusing on the tongue and how it feels on the tongue. Like start there, you know, start there. And then when you're when you're eating you know, mindfully eat. Like, think about, like, if you have toast with honey on it, think about how the toast and honey feel as you're eating it and see, and the next time you're sipping whiskey, do you pick up any of those similarities of toast and honey? And I'm just using that as an example because my three-year-old likes toast and honey. But just anytime you're eating, tasting, or any, it's, it's, it's about thinking about as you are doing it. And if you can trigger your brain to constantly think about it, it it just happens. Like, and you're a creative you're a creative guy, so you, the the words will come to you. They will. See, this to me is it's a little bit of like Coke, like Coca Cola, and then some like walnuts and a little bit of like yeah, like a little bit of nuts. Yeah. Have you already tasted it? No, not yet. Okay, so just smelling it. Ooh, that's hot. That's like, what, 125 proof, I guess? No, but no? it's, no, actually the, the first one uh, was the hottest, the yeah, highest really? in proof. Yeah. I would, have guessed that. I would not have guessed that. Waffles, definitely waffles. <laughs> Mm. Oh, yeah. So definitely more back on the tongue and more like second half of the tongue back toward the throat, not at all to the front of the tongue. Yeah, I'm, it's I, got like a chili, some chili notes in there for me. Yeah, I could see that. Definitely spicy. Yeah, like it though. Like definitely some kick, but um, not sweet at all. Yeah, not sweet at all. Yeah, this has. Uh, this has a uh, like a hatch chili, and oh. it, there's there's some really pronounced chili notes in this one. And we lived uh, in Dallas for three years. There's a whole lot of hatch chilies around. Oh there. yeah, that is that is a fact. <laughs> we miss hatch chili season. Mm. What's the uh, what's the best press box food 
in the in the NFL in the stadiums? Who's got the best food? NFL. Well, I would say, yeah. See, Leah, Leah <laughs> I went already, straight to SEC. Yeah, we we <laughs> spent five years in the SEC, and when I was, I would say, especially when I was covering SEC baseball, Leah would sometimes come up and hang. Um, so, like, what what happened? When we were when I was covering Mississippi State. Is sometimes she would go out to the you know Mississippi State baseball is some of the best in the country. She mm-hmm. go out to the outfield. She bring back like a plate of crawfish or something, mm-hmm. and bring it to the press box, and we would eat or like. Um, just, you know, some great barbecue or whatever. Um, as far as the NFL, I feel like the Patriots um, had great food. Wow. Always clean chowder, always really, really, really high quality. Um, what's weird for me, though, is like I really only go to like one or maybe two games a year now. Hmm. It's so different, you know, like – and people always ask me like, you know, do you miss, do you miss going to games? Um, and I don't know that I do. Um, first of all, like to go to one game, that means I miss many other games, right? right like, right. So like, so I'm in my office now. If you go out there to the right, is our basically basement football watching setup. We have three TVs, couches, and whatever. And so I will watch like Red Zone, two other games on the couch. Sometimes we'll have some friends over. We'll hang out. Like it's a, it's a good, it's a fun Sunday, even though it's working. Um, so I'm not sure that I miss going to games as much. Um, but I, I'll say this, like what I do miss, like Leah mentioned SEC, like I would walk around when I covered Alabama for three years, I'd walk around before the game and kind of like take in the atmosphere of like 1130 for a one o'clock game. And it was like electric, you know, everyone's dressed up, everyone's excited. It's tense. The opposing fans are walking around like, I miss that probably a little bit more than I miss the actual games. Oh wow, yeah, the pageantry, right? That's the uh, yeah, that's the, the word people like to use. So I'd be in the press box. Lee would be with our friends, like drinking and hanging out. Go meet us after I wrote wrote my story at like ten o'clock at night. Yeah, yeah. I used to be I used to be a, a sports copy editor for the Daily Oklahoman, and, and we would uh, oh, wow. we would get we would get the copy in. Um, for those late games, um, and we probably the most notable thing I edited was the Oklahoma State plane crash, and and that was uh, two thousand um, two thousand one, I think, uh, pre nine eleven. But um, wow. yeah, there th- we would always be waiting on you, uh, you game writers, filing late, always creating late. a masterpiece, you know. Yeah, but. Um, yeah, that was uh, newspapers. Oh boy, that uh, that world is it's so different now. You know, I gotta so, say, I do not miss Ian on Deadline. Yeah, Ian on Deadline was not the best Ian. What does that mean? We're so stressed. It was very stressful, and like you'd have to file your story as the game ended. So, mm-hmm. like, God forbid, someone sent me a text message as I'm trying to crank out my masterpiece, like. It got, it got a little bit it got a little tense and then you have to go down you have to talk to people you have to rewrite it like by the time you get to you know see everyone like after the game you're like brain is fried and you're just like can i get a drink get yeah some bourbon whatever i mean it's a hard it really is it's it's not easy and it takes a special skill uh to to write like that and it's completely different now for you i mean it, it's like uh twitter and uh some tv time and you know, a little writing here and there, but you know, what, what's the, since you've been with the NFL network, what's, what is a story that you broke that you were like really proud of? Like when you, when you look back on your, your tenure there, like that's the one that really rings with you. Yeah. I, you know, I try to, I try to think about this whenever I want to make myself feel good. Um, actually one of my sons asked me at dinner tonight, like what's your favorite story you've broken? And I really, there's a couple that I've been like, that I worked a long time on that I've been really proud of. Like I had when the Raiders were moving to Las Vegas, I broke mm-hmm. it on Sunday morning in a story like that never happens. Like that was really cool. Uh, and I worked on it forever. So it was like cool to see that come to fruition. Um, I think my all time favorite like roller coaster ride was when um, Gronk was traded to the Bucks. Oh, and yeah. he retired for a year. He was in like the 
you know, marijuana space and like doing a bunch of ads and like all like he was at Fox and he was kind of like living the life. And there's all these rumors about like, where's he going to go? And it was like April and it was leading up to the draft because I'm making draft calls. And someone I'm talking to goes, and like we had finished the conversation and he goes, hey, you on this Gronk stuff? And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, this Gronk stuff. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, you know, him getting traded to the Bucks. And he said it offhand as if I should know. And I'm like, I don't know what you mean. Tell me everything. He goes, Gronk's getting traded to the Bucks. Start making calls. And I'm like, oh my God, I got to go. And I called four people. I confirmed with three of them. And the last one was like, I don't know, but that sounds right. Three confirmations, one like basically thumbs up. And I report it, but it all took six minutes. So I went wow. from like doing nothing to breaking Gronk coming back in six minutes. It was wild. Wow. And to watch the internet explode and then go on TV and talk about like that was really fun. Um, another one, can I try the drink that you made? Um, another one that I really, really love. Ian just went in for a look with smoky old fashioned there. Is that a smoky oh, old fashioned? So good. We went to a, a sushi place last night and I had a Japanese old fashioned. And oh, nice. uh, I was actually thinking of that all day because it was so delicious. Um, so I, so ESPN and Spike Lee are doing a story, uh, doing a documentary on Colin Kaepernick. And I sat with Spike Lee for it earlier this year. And it was an hour long. And the whole thing was really cool because he's so specific and mm -hmm animated and cares about it a lot and even if i didn't agree with some of the stuff he said it was really the whole experience was really cool so i'm in brooklyn and i'm in the studio and we're 45 minutes in which means we probably got another 15 minutes or so and i get a text and the text is hey fyi bro tyreek's getting traded today you should probably be on it and i look at my text message and i'm trying to play it cool and i gotta like I'm like going like this. And I know that I'm not I'm not gonna leave Spike Lee. I'm just I'm just not. Right. So I'm like, I have like a fire in my pocket, right? And I like secretly text back, I'm like, where's he going? And this person's like, probably Miami, but one other team maybe. That's it. And so I'm like, and Spike's like, is everything okay? And I'm like, no, nah, things fine, like things are good. Uh, and then I like <laughs> I leave there and we like we take a nice picture and I literally run to the car and I start making calls. I talk to like four people involved and finally I get to the point where I can be like the uh, Tyreek Hill has permission to seek a trade, I believe is what it was. And several teams are interested and the Chiefs are likely going to trade him. I think that was sort of the first tweet. Everything went crazy, but it was so surreal because like I'm trying to concentrate on this Spike Lee interview and all I'm thinking is like, Oh my God, Tyreek Hill is going to, and no one knew anything was amiss. So like, wow. I'm trying to like play it cool. And I just want to be like, I want to run out of here and make a lot of phone calls. That was, that was fun to get that one. I would say. Yeah, that's, that's a big get. And I remember when that happened and I was like, cause he, I, I went to Oklahoma state or we, I graduated from Oklahoma state. So Tyreek Hill's like, you know, we've had so many great receivers that have done well in the NFL and, and like, he's like the current one. And I'm like, how did that happen? You know, wh why, how, and you know, and all the in-betweens. And I feel like free agency has become, it has become like its own season now. Like the NFL owns every square inch of, of sporting entertainment now with free agency going off like it, like it has. And that has just got to be so much fun, you know, to get that, well, that rush. You can see Leah laughing. So <laughs> when we started this, we started this, we would say, you know, the season is a lot. It's every Sunday. It's the ramp up to Sunday. So every Saturday I'm working, it's a lot. And every day is something new. So when we started this, we would say like, you know, when the season ends, then it's going to be a lot easier. And at that point we had young kids. Right. And right. we're like, all right, then I'll, finally get to relax we can just make it to super bowl everything will be fine right and then everything get, was not fine everything was not fine you get to super bowl and then it's like combine or senior bowl and then super bowl and then combine and then free agency and then owners are meeting and then draft and like 
I travel more in the off season than I do in the actual season. Way right? worse. Yeah. The yeah, spring is way worse than the fall. I imagine. Yeah. And, 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 and like, so yes, it is fun, but like this spring, especially like every second a bomb could drop. Like there was so much. Now, yeah. So it was a lot of fun, but it was, there was some tense moments. And then we got through the draft and it was like, then, then it was okay. Yeah. In Derby. Yeah. So Ian, I came over, I came over to this side of the world 16 years ago after like seeing the worst in humanity and everything. And, and I, I imagine that you're probably, you probably got into sports writing, you know, because of, uh, you enjoyed sports and everything, but it's no longer just about covering the game. Now you have, you know, you cover, you have to cover everything else. Like, I mean, just an example, like Deshaun Watson, I mean, has that have, has covering some of those, types of stories has that taken back some of the fun a little bit or is that just you realize that's just part of the job now yeah i mean it's well let me let me start from the beginning i i like this because i mean I, i've always liked sports i've always been a sports fan but like i always tell young reporters if you like sports and you want to go to games get a job that pays you good money and buy really good tickets go to games games are awesome drink beer, hang out, watch games. It is so great. I like the writing and the reporting. And for this, like I like what I do now. I like the relationships. I like to break stories. Um, and then I like sports because if you get into this thinking that it's because you like sports, like there's going to be a little bit of a disillusion. Oh boy. Yeah. Hi Jude. This is Jude wow. coming in. Hey buddy. Hi. Hi. How old are you? Seven and a half. Oh, I've got an eight-year-old. Are you Are you into Pokemon or? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you have no, a favorite? No, no Jude. Wait, wait come, no, come back. Just, Who's your yeah. favorite? Who's your favorite Pokemon? Mewtwo. Oh, Mewtwo. Well, that's the ultimate Pokemon. I'm a big Charizard no. fan myself. Arceus is. No. That you're right. You're right. You're right. <laughs> I don't know what any of that means. Yeah, I have no, literally no idea. Oh, uh, Pokemon is uh, it's it's a whole other world. My son and I like we we will battle, and um, yeah, it's fun. He's out. Yeah, he is. All, all I had to do was grown up talk, right? And he's like, oh, this guy, <laughs> you know, this guy's boring. I'm out. Um, uh, no, just kidding. Go ahead, come back, dude. Like, oh, ooh, you what'd you? New three. Oh wow, that's nice. That's good work right there. Very cool, dude. All right, All right goodbye. Shower. Yo. <laughs> so yeah, the main thing I was saying was that um, I like the reporting more than the sports. Mm -hmm. um, that was kind of the main thing I was saying, and I forget what the other point was, but um, no, it's covering covering the the hard news yes. that's right. not sports um, related. So it is actually interesting because there's a lot of what I do that is basically for the kind of like very hardcore fan that is important to me, like breaking a story on a contract, right? Mm -hmm. The fans of the team care very much. People who love football care a lot. People who are sort of casual fans maybe don't care, but like I want to be first. I want to win. It's important, right? Mm -hmm. um, and But it's sort of like, it's a little bit of play, you know, like you break a big football story and like, is it important to the world? Like not always. Right. And then there's other stuff like that's real. Like the Deshaun Watson stuff is real. The stuff with Daniel Snyder um, yeah. on Wednesday is real. And so I don't mind, like I didn't get into this for like to feel great about sports. I got into this because I like the job. I like to report and like, the fact that I sometimes report really important stuff, like it's good, you know? So it doesn't like people will always say, Oh, I'm sorry. We have to talk about this. Like, yes, I'm sorry that these not very good things occur, but mm -hmm. I'm not sorry. I get to report on them because sometimes you get to report some real stuff. Yeah. On, uh, on, you brought up the contracts when, when you get information about like um, the specifics of a, of a contract is, is that, 
is that industry wide just uh is that just given to you like is that in their contract that they're allowed to disclose that or how how does that normally work um a lot of it is relationships um you know like some like there are some people who when they finalize contracts like i'm getting it there are some that give it to other reporters um and then there's other time just because of the relationship you've built up and like you're their guy or they want you to report it for whatever reason. Then there's other times when I'll just kind of find out something. And what a lot of people don't want is they don't want something out before it's done. Cause like, if you say like, Oh, this contract's getting done, then like it really needs to get done. Yeah. Otherwise like, you know, if you're finalizing language and the language isn't done, like, and someone says, Oh, this deal is done. It makes it harder to negotiate. So people are hypersensitive to things not getting out except when they should. Um, so like agents or teams or whoever work with you sometimes to be like, yes, you know this, but let's hang on and we'll kind of figure this out together. And, you know, um, you know, it's, they are, uh, yeah, they are, uh, they're very, I think it's a good thing because these are the people you work with all the time. These are sources you talk to all the time. Um, so it's okay to work with them a little bit. Leah says goodbye, by the way. She got oh. a, uh, she got a message and she's out of here. Well, it was nice okay. hanging out with her again. Um, I, you know, and uh, did she say what her favorite was? Was a glass, was a glass a, um, was that knowingly, her favorite? I'm sure it was. Okay. Um, was I would that say that favorite? was also, that was also my favorite. Yes. Well, although I, um, Glass T, I liked a lot as well. It was just very, it was very, very different. But I kind of liked them all. The only one that was like a little fleeting was B, um, which I I didn't not like, but it was just a little bit quicker. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah, I'll, I'll reveal these here. So I'll start with Glass C. Okay. Glass C was yeah, a. I'll write uh, down for her. Glass C was a Russell's Reserve single barrel pick from a liquor store in uh, Mississippi, actually. Um, and it nice. was um, um, 11 years, 10 months old. Bottle 136 of 138. So that, nice. Okay. Put that one right cool. there. All right. Glass B was uh, Blade and Bow. So this is a... This is a pretty, uh, pretty widely oh, available. I have that. Yeah, pretty widely available bourbon. I just finished that. As a matter of fact. And then no the judgment. champion of the evening. And if you would have put this lineup out there, uh, I would have said this was going to be your champion most likely. Uh, purple top, fifteen year old Willet. Yeah. And yeah. there was this was bottle ninety eight of one hundred and twenty nine bottles. Right. So that yeah. one is uh, – that one's – I actually have that one as well. That one's always going to win. Uh, although I have to say it's frustrating that I didn't recognize them, especially oh. the Blade and Bow. Well, I don't know. Like, oh, that's hard. Cold. Yeah. Especially with one like I, Blade and Bow. Blade and Bow is like – so they acquire a lot of whiskey from other people. And so that's um, the that's the secret sauce of this whole business is like – a lot of people don't make the whiskey that's in the bottle. They buy it from distillers or brokers and and bottle it. So that's the... Yeah, uh, I'm reading... Uh, I'm reading... Uh, your book will be next. Um, or actually, you sent me a couple of them. But um, I'm reading Wright Thompson's bourbon book now. Yeah, I helped uh, him out with that. Yeah, Wright... Didn't? That's yeah, funny. yeah. I'm I'm in the book a lot. But Wright, Wright send me, sent me the book... Um, and uh, he's like, man, I need you to, if you can help me, you know, with this to help me make sure it's like, you know, fact, you know, it's fact friendly, you know, bourbon forward or whatever. And I was like, yeah, I got you. And uh, yeah, I, uh, I love Wright, man. He's uh, such a talented dude, such a, such a powerful voice, such a great writer. And he, he was uh, such an important part of my life. <laughs> They're because, in the SEC world? Well, sort of. Uh, well, two things. One, when I went to New Orleans for the Sugar Bowl, 
I was like, hey, uh, you don't, you know, we'd met a couple of times. Like, you don't know me well, but I'm Ian Rappaport. I'm with the you know, Jackson Claren Ledger. Um, you know, would you mind passing on a couple of restaurants that I should go to in New Orleans? And he sent me like a five page manifesto <laughs> on New Orleans restaurants. I'm like, this guy's amazing. Uh, no, but for real, like him and Kent Babb, who is a Washington Post reporter, um, were the two two great uh, people in my life because I would read them and be like, I can't write like that. Yeah. So me thinking I'm like some great writer and I see, I read them, I'm not as good as them. So I need to not be a writer. I mean, I am a writer, but you know what I mean? Like they really write. So yeah. Like, yeah, right. right was important for me because he showed me like this is what it should be like. Yeah, it you know, it's interesting. Right had that same kind of impact on me and I I loved I've always loved his writing and then when I got to like actually play a role in his uh, in his book Pappy Land, that was that was pretty cool. It was it was pretty cool, but it's also getting to Seeing uh, that was the first bourbon book to make the New York Times bestseller list. Um, you know, he's been he's been great for for the bourbon culture, and and a lot of people have um, you know have went on to check out other books and, and bourbon. So he's brought in a whole new world of of readers for for my genre, and you know I love him for that. But also, he's just a great dude, just a great dude, and you know fun to sip whiskey with so maybe we can all get together and uh have a have a dram in the in the grove you know coming up in the fall or something yeah you know my wife's a mississippi state oh boy i did say that did i (laughs) we have have cowbells they actually made mississippi state made me this one we got a lot of cowbells yeah so grove i don't know but I'm, I'm boycotted now. That's uh, that's funny. Yeah. Well, Ian, it's great having you on. Um, this bourbon journey is just beginning for you, so hopefully, yeah. uh, hopefully, you, you're you're ready for round two this year. You know, you'll 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 find your palate, and you know, you'll start uh, stacking up bottles and tasting some fun stuff. Yeah, I um, I I need to work on it. I need to I need to kind of like you actually give a good suggestion of like thinking more what you're eating. Cause like I will, like I'm saying, like I know what I like and don't like, but I can never name stuff and I need to, um, I need to, I need to work on it. This is good. This is actually Absolutely. really good. Yeah. It's all it is. It's always, uh, it's training 10,000 hours, right? Or 10,000 yeah. or 10,000 bourbons. So I'm cheers to way. you, my friend. Thanks for coming on. And please tell Leah, I said, thank you for coming on as well. Be safe out there. Thank you very much for having me, man. Enjoy everything. I will. Uh, I get to work on these books as well, um, and I'll also get to work on this bourbon. Right on. Thanks. Cheers, brother. Take care, man. <laughs> <laughs>